You think you can swing the bat? Show your bling and let me shine you. I have no idea what you're saying. And your suit sucks. Thank you everyone for your super amazing support on the last video. As usual, leave your comments on this video to be featured at the beginning of the next one. And I'd like to extend an extra special thank you to my patrons Dauber underscore, Stin, Dano, Dotman, and Jesse. Thanks again everybody, and I hope you enjoy the review. Sly Cooper had quite the debut with Simon Says and Meat Beating. Don't get me wrong, it was a great game, but for a game about a master thief, you sure didn't feel like a thief at times. What the hell is even that? I mean, Bentley and Murray didn't even feel like thieves in the last game at all when they were supposed to be part of your band. Luckily, Sucker Punch starts things off strong, addressing my concerns with an opening, dripping, sneaky atmosphere. As our adventure kicks off with Peking Duck and Blizzard breaking into the Cairo Museum of Natural History to steal the clockwork parts. Because surprise, surprise, he's still alive! Kind of. And what do you know? Within two minutes, Bentley already proves to be more useful than he was in almost all of Sly 1. Speaking of being useless, where's Murray? Well, that's one hell of a meteoropic entrance, immediately presenting Murray as the new destructive force of the gang. A bit of a sudden change, but I'd rather this than him be a big pink pussy. With the help of Bentley and Murray, thanks guys, you can go back to hiding in the van for the rest of your miserable lives. We bust into this big open room with no clockwork parts to be found. Oh, Freeze, Cooper. Inspector Fox. Wait, what? As beautiful and unpredictable as ever. Whereas you crooks are so predictable. Carmelita, you're sounding quite... Scene of the crime. American. And so begins the trend of Carmelita getting a new voice actor every fucking game. No! I really don't understand why they change it all the time. Her voice was fine in the first game. I think she just needed more time to adjust to the role. Also, Sly and Carmelita's banter is back and it's just as lovely as ever. Whereas you crooks are so predictable. You always return to the scene of the crime. Crime? I haven't stolen anything. Yet. The character interactions throughout the game are fantastic, and Murray was so funny to me throughout the duration. Little details from how close he is to the Binocicom, come on Murray, that's not social distancing. So the lines he's given and the way he delivers them always makes me chuckle. This is going to be a tough job that requires both our skills. My skills? Okay, Bentley. If you say so. Anyway, Carmelita is not alone as she's packing Constable Nilo alongside her, who alludes to the fact that the clockwork parts being missing could be a Claw Gang job, which is a better name than the Fiendish Five, I guess. Wait, Claw Gang is with a K and two W's? Now that's cool! Things get more epic as Nila perhaps inadvertently distracts Carmelita long enough for the boys to make another getaway, but goddamn, how the hell does she still have a job shooting like that? We get our first cutscene of the game, recapping Sly's origins, and also speculating Nila may be purposely name dropping the Claw Gang? As as you can probably see with the eyeballs. The cutscenes jack up in quality, fully embracing and refining the comic book approach they went for in Sly 1. The style just has such a pop and oomph to it. It's such a fantastic start. I don't know what's in my future, but I won't let it be a repeat of my past. Can I just say that is genuinely one of the most motivational quotes I've ever heard? Ah. Perfect. After that, we're greeted with an episode menu acting as a level select screen accompanied by some Freeform Jazz. <laughs> Peter McConnell is brought in as the new series composer, and he captures the atmosphere the game goes for brilliantly, with nice, smooth, subdued tracks, but also knows when to ramp things up when shit hits the fan, which sometimes sounds like incest intensifying. I really liked, uh, I'm gonna butcher this, Ashif Hakik's work in Sly 1, but McConnell, I feel, is just a better fit for here and the rest of the series, but they're both fantastic in their own right. What's also fantastic are the new hub worlds each episode takes place in. It's no longer one small central area branching off into separate levels, no, this entire area is the level, and there's plenty of ways to keep yourself occupied. You can pick the pockets of patrolling guards or scavenge treasure from around the area, which you bring back to the team's safe house for you to sell on ThiefNet, and then you can use that money to buy power-ups for each member of the gang. There's so many great power-ups from a stealth slide for Sly, which can't be heard by guards and can whiz by them on some Tony Hawk shit, to an adrenaline burst for Bentley, which allows him to break into a lightning fast sprint for a quick getaway. <laughs> Need some new material. I've used that gag like three times. To Atlas Strength for Murray, which allows him to sprint and jump while carrying objects and even enemies. Trust me, it's more useful than it sounds. But the power ups don't stop there because clue bottles return and are scattered throughout the hubs at 30 a pop. A pop? Like a, you know, bottle? Because they're clue bottles. Bottle of soda. A pop? 
Huh? Huh? They're a brilliant way to encourage exploration and help you learn your way around each corner of every map. And your reward for finding all 30 Percocolas is a spicy new power-up, or in some instances, an old one from Sly 1. Lazy fox. There's the knockout dive and invisibility returning, but there's also new ones such as the voltage strike and spin which electrocute enemies, insanity strikes and rage bombs which turn guards from best buddies to illegal cage fighters, to a long toss which lets you throw stuff farther. Yeah, that one's not as cool. What is really cool is each episode is broken up into three acts. A reconnaissance stage where you go around snapping photos of the enemy operation to help formulate a plan to take the baddie down, then tackling a set of missions to put said plan into motion, and finally the episode climaxes with the big heist. And ben Bentley even puts on a cute little slideshow for you going over everything, how adorable, he's even got markers. All these changes made continue to feed into this massive shift in tone which I love. You really feel like a conniving rat in this game from just about everything you do. From sneaking onto moving trains to steal clockwork parts to snagging radio attacks from fucking bears, and even planting bugs, sometimes literally, in the main baddies headquarters to listen in on their conversations which also just gives the world and its villains a little bit more spice, ha ha ha, you'll get that joke soon. Even further in Encouraging stealth is the new health and combat system. No more lucky charm shit, that's for kids. That's the wrong cereal. The enemies are much tougher now, no longer being able to be taken down with a simple whack of your cane, especially not the flashlight guards. A toddler would have a better chance beating Brock Lesnar in a fair fight than you'd have against these fucking barbarians. To take these hulking beasts down, you'll need to surprise them from behind. What? What? But as much as I adore the stealth heavy approach this game takes, you need to find a happy medium to avoid the experience becoming tedious. And what better happy medium is there than death and destruction? And who better to serve some of that up than... The Murray! I mean, you can try sneaking with him anyway, bless his heart, he's trying his best. As I alluded to earlier, Murray is now like the powerhouse of the group who just bulldozes his way through any obstacles thrown at him. There's not much to his gameplay, it's just beating people up, lifting things up, and putting them down. That's all he does, and that's all he needs to do. He's great. Except for throwing, he's pretty shit at that. Another great little touch I forgot to mention is when you kill an enemy sometimes, there will be like a POW sound, again, like a comic book, which I think is really cool. It's such a nice little touch. Shut up. Bentley, on the other hand, is more methodical to play as. He's the most fragile of the three, so he has to rely on his gadgets such as sleep darts and bombs to help him get through life. Hacking missions even return to become a staple in this game. I think they overstay their welcome a little but not enough to where it really hurts the game for me, so whatever. On top of those, there's even Bentley missions where you control an RC chopper, which controls a bit awkwardly at first, but you get the hang of it. And then there's of course Sly, who feels sneakier than ever because now he's learned to move without breaking into a sprint. He now prance around by default and can break into a run with R1. Not to mention he's back with the signature rail walk, slides, pipe climbing, and spire jumps whenever they want to actually fucking work. I love how each of the three members really have their own unique strengths and weaknesses. All of them serving a legit purpose now, making them feel like a true band of thieves. It's a shame that Bentley and Murray are pretty slow to maneuver around more vertical maps, but I'm just glad that they're useful at all now. But yeah, thanks to Neela's usefulness, we're off to thump the Claw Gang members one by one and steal their respective clockwork parts, starting with Dimitri, a rejected artist turned nightclub owner on the west side of Paris who's using the clockwork tail feathers as printing plates to produce counterfeit money. He also learned all his English from watching music videos, and that is fucking amazing. So after following the structure, I explained earlier, it's time to head into the final stretch. The gang rips the nightclub sign from its moorings to send it crashing into the ground where Sly can infiltrate Dimitri's sub lab for a confrontation and wow. What a confrontation it is. What is this with clocks, bro? Have you no vision? Are you hearing what I mean to you? You think you have juice? Don't show me a little mind when talking about such big things. You think you can swing the bat? Show your bling and let me shine you. I have no idea what you're saying. And your suit sucks. As for the boss fight itself, it's pretty decent. You just gotta look out for Dimitri's beams and be ready to dodge a strike once you're up close. Once Dimitri's busted, we head off to India to take down Rajan, who's in possession of the clockwork wings. He was a poor lad growing up on the streets of Calcutta and began his life of crime selling illegal spices, which eventually brought him to present day where he's become the Claw Gang's lead spice manufacturer. After tricking Miss Carmelita into a dance with Sly, that gives the gang the distraction they need to steal the wings right out from Rajan's ballroom party. Humiliated, he retreats to literally the heart of his spice operation deep in the jungle where episode 3 takes place. Long story short, we destroy his spice operation in slow motion. 
which brings him out of hiding, and Neela, who's been helping us throughout the game so far by leading us to secret entrances for missions and even setting up the ballroom dance with Carmelita, betrays us, leading to Sly getting incapacitated and Murray having to step in to deal with Raja. Fly! Jesus Christ, Murray. On some real shit, I just love everything Murray does. I love this cutscene. It's so yummy. Who's the Murray? All I see is a fat, pathetic weakling. I might be big and not as smart as the other guys, but one thing I'm not is weak. Speaking of yummy, Rajan's flight is pretty solid. Rajan tries to strike you with a staff and can even electrify the water around you, which will fry you if you're not on a lily pad. He even sends his guards out to gang up on you, but of course it's nothing the Murray can't handle. After pounding some tiger ass, Sly, Murray, and even Carmelita are all arrested as she was framed by Neela for apparently being in league with the Cooper gang the whole time, which leaves Bentley by himself. <laughs> I've gone on about how much I love the way this game leans into the stealth side of things much more than the last, but my absolute favorite thing about Sly 2 is easily Bentley's character arc. Going back to Sly 1, he never left the van, and was even disgusted at the thought of stepping foot outside of it in the case of Haiti. Then he was terrified to be out on the field at all in the beginning of this game, but time after time his confidence has continued to swell with each passing job he's completed. And now this dude is slashing his way through the jungle all the way back to the team van, which he now learns to drive himself, and does a week of data crunching to find where his best friends have been imprisoned so he can free them. What. A. Beast. This leads to episode 4, Jailbreak where Bentley has to make his way to the Contessa's prison in Prague. The Contessa, who is a high-ranking member of Interpol but is also a secret member of the Claw Gang as their chief hypnotist, married a wealthy aristocrat who just so happened to die of poisoning a mere few weeks after their wedding ceremony. She then proceeded to open a rehabilitation center for criminals with her newly inherited estate, where she would supposedly relieve criminals of their bad vibes. But really, she was just hypnotizing them to tell her where they hid all their loot. After doing some eavesdropping on the eight-legged cow, hacking the train system to send it crashing through the prison walls, and disposing of the guards on duty along said prison walls, Sly is freed. The duo breaking into solitary confinement as Murray purposely got himself thrown in for the plan and, uh... <laughs> Well, he's on drugs. Who is that? Who, who, what's the contestant's been using these hypno boxes to heighten the effects of illegal spice they've been feeding him, but after destroying the machines, he's back to normal, or at least as normal as Murray can be. Unfortunately, despite their pursuit, the Contessa escapes, but who gives a shit? This is adorable. They're laughing and smiling and eating hot dogs. They're so happy to be together again. So the Contessa is now hiding out at her castle estate and more importantly, is in possession of the clockwork eyes. With word getting out of her corrupt tactics, I mean, who knew a big ass spider wasn't all warm and fuzzy inside after all. Neela was granted a full scale army from Interpol as a means of taking her down. It turns out that Carmelita has been taken to the Contessa's re-education tower, ready to be brainwashed with the help of the clockwork eyes. Wow, DeviantArt must have had a field day with this. Eventually the gang frees Carmelita and she chases the Contessa. How did you miss that? Car then everything just breaks into complete chaos. Neela gets the clockwork eye, Bentley fucking dies, or somehow doesn't. What the hell? Carmelita took the other eye, and we gotta chase her down in the most awkward to control vehicle I've ever used in my entire life, but by some miracle, we gun her down. The Contessa's ass is kicked quite easily twice. Oh god, more TV and art material! And yeah, that, uh got out of hand quickly, but that's yet another clockwork part for the Cooper gang. And now it's time for a literal cooldown period as the gang heads off for John Bisson in Canada. Bisson was a prospector during the gold rush who was frozen in an avalanche, but due to global warming, he thawed out, and now serves as spice distributor for the Claw Gang through his train system across North America. Personally, the Canada levels are my favorite. I love snowy settings, as I'm sure you guys know by now, and I think John Bisson's episodes are host of some of the most fun missions in the game, from tailing Carmelita to infiltrating Bisson's trains to stealing an eagle egg and more. I just think they're really fun. Bisson is in possession of the clockwork lungs and stomach. By the final heist, the gang had already swiped the lungs off two of his trains, but on the third train, Neela re-emerges attempting to snatch the clockwork stomach for herself, leading to a showdown with Bentley's RC chopper and what I found to be a moderately challenging battle. She sends out her own little biplanes and there's projectiles she fires at you which can be pretty tricky to evade at times. Because of constantly trying to avoid taking damage, it makes getting some shots of your own in harder, which I think is a 
really neat little element to the fight. This was awesome. Definitely my favorite boss of the game. After doing away with her twice, the clockwork stomach is I've in our possession. Oh, hand, shut the fuck that, up, slob. Lads notice some sketchy shit going on with the Northern Lights, so they decide to follow them, which leads to Bassan's lumber camp, where he is also in possession of the clockwork talons, where we get word of the final claw gang member, Arpeggio, allegedly making his way over to pick up the Northern Light battery. The only way the gang could possibly seize Arpeggio's clockwork brain is by sneaking onto his blimp, and the only foreseeable way to do that would be to drain the Northern Light battery of its power and stow away inside during the pickup. But before then, we of course have to retrieve the clockwork talents from Bassan, who decides to gamble them in his lumberjack games. As you'd expect, the gang enters the competition and does whatever they can to make sure things go their way. But despite their best efforts to throw off Bassan, he unfortunately has the judges intimidated so that they'll always score his performances 7.8 out of 10 too much water. This leads to the gang having to improvise by leading the duck judges into a cave and stealing their clothes to disguise themselves so they can curb the scores. Wait, does this mean they ripped off their fucking beak? Once again, this goes south for our boys, however, causing the three to be put out of commission by Bisan. And on top of that, Bisan even confiscates the clockwork parts they've collected and sells them all to Arpeggio, completely undermining everything the gang has done and gone through to make it this far. On the bright side, this leads to, in my opinion, a pretty neat fight. Bentley uses a walkie-talkie to communicate with Sly, who's inside the sawmill control room, to inform him of when to activate certain traps when Bisan is in the proper position. I don't know, I thought that was pretty cool. The gang escapes and books it for the Northern Light Battery, and before they know it, they're up and away. Oh, they lost the van too? Are you kidding me? The final chapter, episode 8, in my opinion, for the atmosphere alone, is great. It's just this chaotic whirlwind perfectly encapsulating the impending dread of Clockwork being resurrected, and how everything could go haywire any second now. Unfortunately for the Cooper gang, Clockwork has already been fully reconstructed, and Neil is here. Will you just die already? Here we get a lengthy exposition of, well, everything up to this point and why it all matters. Arpeggio's backstory is basically that he can't fly, so he wants to use Clockwork's body to be able to fly. Or at least that's what the cutscene about him would lead you to believe. But here he explains that immortality is what he seeks, and Clockwork's vessel is the perfect prop for eternal life. Basically, Arpeggio lets Sly retrieve all the Clockwork parts for him, and plans to unload a hypnotic light show of hate on the people of Paris from his blimp, using the power of the Northern Light batteries he's been collecting, along with legal spice produced by Rajan and distributed by John. <laughs> And said spice was laced in the food of many people at Dimitri's nightclub. And the spice is also susceptible to a hypnotic rage as proven by Murray. And apparently Clockwork has been immortal this whole time because of hatred. Uh, sure, we'll go with that. Definitely has nothing to do with the fact that he's a fucking robot. Then Neela double-crosses yet another person, yes, Arpeggio lasted that long in the story, and merges herself with Clockwork to become... Clockla? But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? Well, that happened. Let's kill it. The fight here is quite tedious in my opinion, just slow moving rockets and electric rings stand in your way, both of which are easy to take down. Once you bring Clockla's health down low enough, she storms off towards the safe house in a rage and rips it from the blimp and not before Murray gets one last pose in for those with the benefit of flash photography. With the blimp in shambles and Clockla out in the distance with our captive friends, it's just a very surreal climax, just like the one I gave your mom. Soaring out into the void, you eventually make it to the bird and whack its head until it comes crashing down. Now it's time to pry open Clockla's mouth and destroy the, the hate ship, which is the source of her power. Okay, you're really losing me here. Bentley's snags the hate ship and then let's get out of here she's about to explode ah! okay as much as i think they stumbled a lot heading up to the finish line they miraculously stuck the landing this ending is fantastic carmelita smashes the hate ship and clockwork disintegrates right before their very eyes and as sly perfectly puts it how ironic that carmelita a police officer would be the one to lift the curse from the Cooper family. She places the gang under arrest, but Sly agrees to go peacefully so long as she lets his friends walk. And then... Something happens. The two begin talking like they're on a first date, finally getting the chance to really see each other's personal sides. And this is especially brilliant because they've had a sort of unlikely bond forming throughout the game. Well, with Sly setting her free from the Contessa, helping her escape from the cops thanks to Neela soiling her reputation, then once again working together to take down Clockwork. It's just ingenious storytelling. It's wonderful. And it looked like my pals had left me a little going away present before taking off. Floating away on the night breeze, I could faintly make out Carmelita's voice. I'll find you, Cooper! I'll be 
I love this ending. And well, I love this game. I love how much more of a team the gang feels like here and love how their friendship feels much stronger than ever before. The refined art style is fantastic. The music is atmospheric. The game just feels more thievey, which is exactly what I wanted from the mission structure to the operations and even little additions like treasures and pickpocketing. The clue bottles are nicely repackaged. The hub worlds are a great change. The story is much more layered. And hey, this game's funnier than the first too, so that's a bonus. I should have figured a puny turtle like you would find a rat hole to squirm through well i just dropped my glasses had to come pick them up on the flip side as happy as i am that bentley and murray are much more useful this time around as i said they can be very tedious to venture through a couple of the hubs unfortunately speaking of tedious the missions also get a bit repetitive like doing recon and pickpocketing over and over again but they do a decent enough job making these missions feel distinct and while a little more variety would be nice Obviously, I don't find either of these problems massively damaging to the game at all. All things considered, Sly 2 is still a fantastic game. But seriously, the clockla thing sucked cockla.